Welcome, Eagles, to another episode of Trad Cat Night Radio. I am Eric Kajewski, founder and owner of Trad Cat Night, the most viewed and followed traditional Catholic website worldwide, ranked number one in the world as it relates to traditional Catholicism. And today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad we're getting back into this overall topic of health, uh, you know, slash environmental toxins. We're going to be a little bit more specific and talk about uh, gut health, good bacteria versus bad bacteria. I have with me today Dr. Joanne Conaway, and her website is drj conaway. That's c o n a w a y dot com. You should you can also find her now on Critical Health News. Uh, so that is some really good news uh, for her. Also, you can find uh, some of her talks on YouTube, which I highly encourage. I'm going to add a related link. You'll find all this information in, in the description box, as always, for those who've been following Tradcat Night for a while. So you don't even have to go searching for it. You'll find it right in front of your face. Now, many of you know my story. Uh, coming off of uh, Xanax many, many years ago, uh, kind of destroying my health. I mean, there's really no better way of, of putting it. Uh, I still to this day have neurological disturbances from taking this one drug. I want to get into that a little bit later in terms of the role of Big Pharma and how that ties into all this. But today's guest is, as I mentioned, has a very extensive background. Uh, you know, RN, BSN. It's kind of interesting, too. Her, her story is very similar to a family member of mine who left nursing for a lot of the same issues. <laughs> they don't want to deal with the mainstream uh, anymore. So she has a unique perspective on medicine, medicine and healthcare. Having started her career as a uh, nurse earning a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing 1976, her experiences span all medical disciplines. Having started in the ER and continuing in operating room, critical care, cardiac care, and nutritional support. These experiences afforded her the opportunity to observe the human body from various aspects of health and disease while doing nutritional support she cared for people who could no longer eat by mouth receiving all their nutrition uh, intravenously or by tube feeding dr conaway gained an in-depth understanding of nutrition at the cellular level and the importance of gastrointestinal system function that's today primarily what we're going to be focusing on she's also a retired lieutenant colonel i'll let her add whatever she would like to to this talk and we really could go on and on with her her background and her bio but today specifically why is america so sick and i'll leave that link so you can get uh that particular uh talk which is on our website and also on critical health news as well so without any further ado let's welcome on dr joanne uh conaway and i guess uh, as a backdrop uh dr conaway you know, tell us maybe a little bit more about yourself, how you got involved with this work, and ultimately, how did you come about in writing Why Is America So Sick? Well, I'd be delighted to do that, Eric, and thank you so much to be with me this afternoon. I'm very excited whenever someone asks me about my background and how I got involved in what I'm doing, because from my perspective, I, as you mentioned, I was a nurse. I was a nurse for 40 years, and I did the bedside nursing, and I worked with patients. But during that time, I did have the opportunity to do specialized nutritional support, as you mentioned. And it was then that I learned not only the importance of critical nutrients in terms of the 90 essentials, as we refer to them, those nutrients that we know we all need, but I also learned a lot in terms of the function of the gastrointestinal system and start to pay more attention to just how important it is, not just to digest our food, but also very important from the standpoint of being our immune system. 75 to 80% of our immunity is housed in our digestive system. We must have a healthy immune system in order for us to be healthy. And that's from all aspects. That's from the cardiovascular perspective, the endocrine perspective, the reproductive perspective, the respiratory perspective, the neurological perspective. So I find it fascinating when you talk about your history and your past and some of the issues that you're still dealing with. When we look at any pharmaceutical or any drug that's given to anyone, and especially over a length of time, 
We know that those pharmaceuticals impact the health of the digestive system. And until or unless we do what it takes to overcome that impact, we're going to have lifelong problems. So how do we overcome that? Well, we first have to recognize that we have a microbiome. And very simply put, that's our digestive system. We want to make sure that we have a balance of good, healthy gut bacteria versus the unhealthy gut bacteria. We want to have more of the healthy gut bacteria. We all have different types of the unhealthy bacteria. It's how does our body handle those, and are they allowed to proliferate and overgrow, if you will? So when we look at trying to deal with the microbiome, we want to make sure that we have lots of healthy bacteria and don't allow for an overgrowth of the unhealthy bacteria. What happens is kill off the healthy bacteria very easily. That happens all the time. That happens if we take antibiotics. That happens if we take any type of pharmaceutical. That happens if we eat the standard American diet. Our standard American diet, our food supply in this country today is loaded with those things that do not provide nutrition, but more importantly, they damage the microbiome. So in order to correct those issues, what we need to do of the system of good probiotics, ensure that we eliminate those things that are contributing to ill health in the digestive system, and make corrections so that several things will happen. Well, of course, first, boost the immune system. But even more importantly in most respects is we also then allow for the body to be able to better absorb any nutrition that's taken in, any good healthy foods that are taken in, any of those supplements that we feel are so important, they'll be better absorbed if your digestive system is working at an optimal level. So I got very excited about this when I first did nutritional support nursing. I got even more excited about it when I had my son who had his own challenges with skin issues, and we determined after many years that his skin issues were all gut-related issues. What was happening on the outside was a reflection of an unhealthy inside, and when we corrected what was going on on the inside, he got rid of his eczema that he had had for eight years in a period of five days. Wow. That did greatly, and that's what drove me to do what I do today. So let's get a little bit more of a backdrop. I mean, what were you witnessing in, in quote unquote mainstream nursing uh, that ultimately, you know, led you to say, listen, I, I can't do this anymore. Uh, I know for, for some of my own family, you know, whether it's vaccines or, or maybe something else specifically, but what, what was the defining moment for you that you said, okay, no, I, I can't go this route anymore. Well, I was working in cardiac nursing and I had by this time, started to study the all-natural approach to health and wellness and it had in fact been involved in a an all-natural approach from the standpoint of those 90 essential nutrients as we call them. And so what I was seeing away from the hospital was those people that I was working with and helping to advise in terms of good nutritionals and cleaning up the diet and the other things that we find so important, I was seeing significant benefits. They were getting off blood pressure medications. They were getting off their cardiac drugs. They did not have to go in repeatedly for the testing that we do to make sure that the statin drugs are not ruining your liver. All of these things, these people no longer had to deal with all the time, and yet the patients I was taking care of in the hospital still had to deal with them continuously. They were on those cardiac meds. They were not seeing significant changes being on those cardiac meds. They were getting worse. Those meds, in my opinion, were making them worse. Those cardiac medications, the toxins that develop in the system as a result of those cardiac medications were making them sicker and sicker and sicker. And we all know the stories of people who are on various different medications. And then, unfortunately, they have to go on additional medications to overcome the side effects of the initial medications. Yes. This is what I was seeing. And it was happening all the time. And, and I was seeing these patients come back into the hospital time after time after time, no improvement, getting worse, 
changing those meds, those meds that were changed were not providing any improvement. They were not getting these patients well, and I, I can't do this anymore. Furthermore, having to stand there and tell a patient that they should be taking this drug and all the reasons why this drug would be so helpful and so beneficial and why it's necessary, I couldn't do that. It was hypocritical on my part because I didn't believe what I was saying to them. And yet, if I was going to follow what I had to follow from the standpoint of practicing conventional medicine, that's exactly what I had to do. So I finally just said, that's it, I can't do it. And I just walked away. That's when I went back to school in earnest. I finished my Doctor of Traditional Naturopathic Medicine degree, and I wrote my book. And it has to do with the fact that I am very concerned about the health of people in this country today because they feel that the doctor knows best, and they subscribe to everything the doctor says. And the unfortunate thing is, doing that, and eating an unhealthy diet and putting yourself in a situation where someone else controls your destiny, that just does not fit with me. I am very committed to body, mind, and spirit, and I do not believe that someone else should be put in complete control of what I do for my body. Yeah, it seems, you know, uh, just uh, on every level, if you will. However you want to label, you know, this particular nefarious group, which is trying to implement their new world order. You know, we're not just being affected in our food, folks. It's in the air, whether it's chemtrails, whether it's the water supply, whether it's just in the education system, Common Core, uh, et cetera, et cetera, trying to dumb us down. Uh, we'll break that down a little bit. But I, I wanted to follow up on a point that she made. You know, one of the immediate things that I noticed when I had taken Xanax was gastrointestinal problems i mean it was bizarre like not being able to go to the bathroom for like a week and then not being able to stop going to the bathroom the next day i mean it was just bizarre. i mean it was just so i couldn't get a, a control of it um and then also i wanted to add in terms of the whole big pharma uh it seems to me and correct me if i'm wrong but it's just it's just all big business you know keeping people trapped uh in the system if you will i don't know if there's a better word of of uh putting it and, uh, you know, so let, let's do this. Why don't you break down good b bacteria versus bad bacteria? We'll break that down a little bit so people can understand a little bit better specifically what's going on in the gut. Sure. When we talk about good bacteria, we talk about the strains of bacteria, the ones most people are familiar with are the lactobacillus strains of bacteria or the bifidobacterium strains of bacteria. And when we talk about those, those are the healthy gut bacteria. And the way the body works is we're supposed to have a lot of those healthy gut bacteria, somewhere between three to five pounds in the adult human. So we want all of those healthy bacteria so that when we take in healthy foods, the healthy bacteria help us to break down foods to release those molecular structures from the digestive system out into the vascular system to be taken throughout the body to do the jobs that need to be done. If we have an overgrowth of unhealthy bacteria or bad bacteria, and one of the ones that most people are familiar with would be the candida albicans or candida yeast type bacteria. That's something that we all have, and it's perfectly okay as long as we have plenty of good healthy bacteria. If we unfortunately kill off the healthy bacteria, that bad bacteria continues to grow and continues to proliferate and ultimately causes problems. The yeast bacteria will break down the integrity of the inside lining of the digestive system. But even more importantly, what research is showing us is those unhealthy bacteria actually break our foodstuffs down in a totally different way. And now what gets released into the vascular system, instead of the good healthy molecules of broken down food, we see the release of poisons. Bad bacteria process our foods differently, and now what leaves the digestive system is unhealthy food or poisons. And then those poisons go through the circulation, and they ultimately take up residence somewhere in the body. They may be taking up residence in the joints and contribute to a rheumatoid arthritis. They may take up residence in the thyroid and contribute to a Hashimoto's thyroiditis. These conditions are considered autoimmune. The body is attacking itself 
And this should not be happening. Talk. So the end result is go ahead. No, go ahead, finish up. No, I was gonna say the end result is we have all of these autoimmune conditions. Big pharma is very quick to come up with a, a pharmaceutical that is going to help to treat the symptoms of the autoimmune condition. Conventional medicine says, oh my goodness, it's an autoimmune condition. Your immune system is in hyperdrive. We need to slow it down. So now what we do is we give people an immunosuppressant drug and we suppress the immune system, which is our way to fight infection. So now we don't have the mechanisms necessary. We have an unhealthy gut to start with, which is a very important part of that immune system. And now we're going to take a medication to further suppress the immune system. And then people wonder why they're getting so sick and why they can't deal with the activities of daily life. My question for you, doctor, would be this. Uh, you know, I recently started taking a product called Kefir, which I'm sure you've heard of. It mm -hmm. apparently has a lot of uh, good bacteria in it. And I've noticed almost immediately kind of just, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to call it increased energy, but I mean, I, I did feel a lot better after taking it for a short period of time. Uh, maybe if you could just comment on that and just in general on, you know, what are the best types of probiotic pills or, I mean, you know, is, is there a specific kind out there that we should be picking up or certain ones that we should be staying away from because maybe they're knockoff or... Well, there are various different probiotic products. There are a lot of probiotic products on the market. Some are good. Some are not so good. What I like to encourage people to do is look for a good probiotic product that has several different strains of probiotic. One of the things that we're learning is it's not just Lactobacillus acidophilus. It's not just Bifidobacterium infantis. There are other things that we need. So a program that I have put together encourages people to take probiotic products that, that have several strains of good healthy probiotics. It's also, it also has to do with the way those probiotics are actually processed. There are various different companies out there that like, as we know, most companies that are out there, maybe I shouldn't say most, but a lot of companies that are out there kind of throw something together. And at the time of manufacture, there might be 10 billion um, live cultures, but by the time they get to the grocery store shelf or to the drugstore shelf, most of those good, healthy, live cultures are dead. They're gone. So when we talk about trying to get the good, healthy bacteria, Kefir is a great way to do it. You, of course, want to look for a high-quality Kefir product. Don't buy any of those cheap ones because you buy cheap, you get cheap, literally. Fermented foods is another way to go. Many, many people are fermenting their foods now, which is a great way to go. But I have put together a program using the products that I'm most familiar with, with the company that I work with, actually a system of good probiotics. Gives people a lot of good digestive enzymes, both with meals, to help you to break down the meal that you're eating, but also between meals. One of the fascinating things we know about taking you know, good and there's no food in the stomach to act on, those enzymes will leave the digestive system and go through and clean up the blood. So that becomes very important from the standpoint of cleaning up those, we call them circulating immune complexes, those things that are the trash, if you will, that have left the digestive system. Now they're circulating in the vascular system. Let's get those cleaned up. The other product that I include in my program is a fantastic product that literally helps to prevent the bad bacteria from clinging to the inside lining of the digestive system. So in the program, and anyone who wants information on the program can always just go out to my website and send me an email. But what this program does is it floods the system with good probiotics, helps to use those enzymes to both break down food and clean up the trash, if you will, and also provides the benefit of not allowing the bad bacteria to actually cling to the inside lining of the gut, moving it out more quickly. Once you do that and get the gut in balance, to your point, you said using Kefir in a very short amount of time, you're already seeing more energy, you're already feeling a little bit better. The imbalance of gut bacteria contributes to your health overall. And if you are 
balancing that bacteria, you're going to have more energy. One of the key things when people say, well, how do I know that I don't have a healthy gut? Well, one of the key factors that we find is if you don't have a healthy the digestive system, if you are processing foods more with bad bacteria than the good bacteria, you sit down and eat a meal, and it's a healthy meal, okay? It's not a trash meal. It's a healthy meal. Expecting to get the fuel that your body needs to go out and function and do jobs that need to be done. Instead, you eat that meal, and you want to go take a nap. That is a key indicator that what's happening in your digestive system is because you don't have enough of the good, healthy gut bacteria, the bad bacteria is processing your food, yielding toxins, and making you sleepy, making you want to go take a nap rather than reviving you and giving you the energy you need to go and do the things you need to do. Now, are you finding uh, more and more, I mean, it's kind of along the same lines in terms of chronic fatigue. Are you, are you finding more and more people coming to you who are earlier in their ages, I mean, maybe they're not in their 40s, 50s, or 60s, you know, maybe 20s and 30s, who are experiencing uh, these types of symptoms, um, you know, kind of, I just kind of say this here in America, you know, overworked, overloaded, you know, sit in front of TVs and computers with EMFs and also a bad diet contributes into that. It seems to me it's, it's education based, but then it's also discipline. I mean, people actually have to want to eat right. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And of course we have the younger people who think they're bulletproof. And when you try to tell them, and to your point, yes, to answer your question, I have a lot more younger people coming to me. In fact, sad to say, I have a lot of infants whose parents are bringing them to me. Why? Because these infants are having these same kinds of issues, these same kinds of problems. And that has a lot to do with immunizations and the fact that many times a baby is born and born cesarean section, so they don't get the benefit of mom's good health of that bacteria as they're born coming down the birth canal. So the end result is, you know, when, you, when a baby's born vaginally, the baby comes into the world and they've had exposure now to mom's good healthy bacteria as they've come through the birth canal. Well, in an operating room, in a C-section situation, the baby doesn't have that benefit. The baby is born into a sterile environment in the operating room and then their digestive systems are colonized by the staff and the other babies in the nursery not by mom. So the end result is these kiddos come out and unfortunately, they don't have that good bacterial balance beginning in their digestive systems. And within no time at all, they're starting to exhibit symptoms. They have chronic ear infections for which they get an antibiotic. That antibiotic further kills off the good gut bacteria. And we have children who are sick from the time they're born. I have moms bringing kids to me four months old and the doctor wants to put them on an antacid medication. medication, But they can't keep their formula down or they can't keep their breast milk down. They have colic, they're constantly fussy, and all of these things are happening because their digestive systems are healthy. So I'm seeing more and more young people. I'm seeing very young people. And it all has to do with the fact that we either A, don't have good bacteria because we're born in a cesarean section situation, mm -hmm. then we're immunized, or B, we have been in this world and for the last 12, 15 years, all I've eaten is fruit roll-ups and you know, macaroni and cheese out of a box, and now I don't have a healthy gut, I don't have any good healthy gut bacteria, I can't fight infection. <laughs> Speaking along the same lines, listen, I, you know, I was in college and I was one of those guys where I was drinking, you know, half a dozen cups of coffee, you know, a day just to make it go, and then just eating kind of on the run. Unfortunately, that's how Western society is for, for the most part. If you were to give us a top three or five worst foods to eat, you know, what would they be? You know, processed, high fructose, I mean, but specifically what? I mean, just say absolutely no way. Stay away from these. Well, I have to say that I over the course of the last several years, have become a real proponent of gluten-free. Now, if your digestive system is working, if you expose yourself to gluten, you're likely to not have a problem. However, even if your digestive system is working well, if you expose yourself to gluten, you're setting yourself up for problems, and you don't have to have issues 
that are digestive issues. This is one of the things that has been shown in the literature, and there's been much written about this. You can be gluten intolerant or sensitive to the impact of gluten and never have a gastrointestinal symptom. So people will say to me, oh, I can't believe that you're so hard on wheat. When I eat wheat, I don't have a stomach upset. I don't have diarrhea. I don't have bloating. I don't have any of those things. I know wheat doesn't bother me. What they don't understand is how wheat does bother them once it is processed and once all those carbohydrates then enter the system. So I say stay as gluten-free as you possibly can. Certainly, if you have celiac, you need to be gluten-free. If you have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, you need to be gluten-free. But for the most part, I believe everyone should limit the gluten dramatically because it is so harmful to the rest of the body. So that means no bread, pasta, cakes, cookies, many ice creams have gluten. There are many yogurts that have gluten. There's a lot of things out there that have gluten. The second thing that I say stay away from is certainly stay away from genetically engineered and genetically modified foods. The big three there are going to be corn, and from corn we get high fructose corn syrup, one of the things that you mentioned. Soy, now those two in particular, they're found in nearly every processed food, and they're found named various different things. Now, one of the things that we're learning is they don't want to put high fructose corn syrup on the label, so instead now they're putting like liquid sugar or something else like that, not, not actually identifying it as high fructose corn syrup, which is so harmful. So corn and soy, most heavily subsidized crops in this country, are also the ones that are most likely to be genetically engineered and genetically modified. So those two things. But now the other big thing that we have to be careful of is sugar beets. So now when you pick up something and you look at the label, it may not say high fructose corn syrup. It may say sugar. Chances are real good that sugar is coming from sugar beets, and sugar beets are now genetically modified. A lot of the sugar beets are genetically modified. So you've got to stay away from prepackaged and processed foods. Bottom line, okay? So those things in particular, I say stay away from. High fructose corn syrup, as you mentioned, is very problematic. People don't realize it. If you go out there and look at some of the research that's been done, it's fascinating to see how the obesity problem in this country, when you look at graphs of the increase in the numbers of people who fall into that obese category, and you overlay the influx of high fructose corn syrup into the diet, they almost match up perfectly. And that's because high fructose corn syrup, unfortunately, is very detrimental to the system for various different reasons, not the least of which is it interferes with hormones that help our bodies to recognize that we're eating, recognize that we're satiated. A big one that it interferes with is leptin. Leptin is a hormone in the body produced in the fat, and it signals the brain that there's enough fat on board, we can kick up the metabolic rate and burn up some of this fat. Well, if that message isn't getting to the brain, since the brain doesn't know what the body looks like in the mirror, it's not getting the message, so it thinks it needs more fat and more fat and more fat. So when you eat high fructose corn syrup, you stimulate the body to want more. The other thing is we don't have any nutrition in the foods that we eat if they're prepackaged and processed foods. So back to your original question. What's the other thing that I say stay away from? Carbonated beverages. Carbonated beverages neutralize the acid in your stomach. That's a whole different topic for another day. But if you don't have enough stomach acid, you can't break down the initial bonds of protein in your foods. You cannot assimilate B vitamins, calcium, zinc, boron, any of those things that are the trace minerals that the body needs. If you're taking antacids or if you're drinking carbonated beverages, you're damaging your system. Huh. And the other thing is fats. You have to stay away from fats. Now people say, but there's a lot of good research out there about things like olive oil and things like coconut oil. The problem is, first of all, in this country, and I'm sure other people have talked about it on your show, our olive oil is not olive oil. And the sad reality is that there is a lot done to oil to make it look, smell, and taste like olive oil, but it's not olive oil. And unless you're spending really good money getting like a $30 a bottle for a half a quart of olive oil, you're not getting good olive oil. The problem is when you eat oils like that, that have, first of all, not olive oil, but more importantly, 
become rancid every time you open the bottle because they begin to oxidize every time they're exposed to oxygen. You start eating oils like that and they quickly become trans fats in the body and they quickly start to impact your system from the standpoint of unhealthy fats and trans fats and those things that we know that are not good. So those would probably be the big five in my book, the things that you need to stay away from. I always say you should eat organic. Organic at least will limit the amount of pesticide and herbicide that that produce or fruit has been exposed to. And remember also that if you're eating meat, for example, if those animals have been fed genetically modified foods, you're going to be getting genetically modified foods. Now, doctor, is there any connection between uh, a deficiency in good gut bacteria and overall mental health issues? Absolutely. And one of the more fascinating fields of research now, and my next book is going to talk more about this because it's just so fascinating for me, is the gut-brain connection. Brain access. And simply put, we have to recognize that there's a bi-directional pathway. The vagus nerve from the brain to the gut, from the gut to the brain. So if your gut's unhealthy, what leads your gut and travels up the vagus nerve is unfortunately a lot of toxins and things that are going to impact a health brain. And then those messages from the brain back to the gut or to anywhere else in the body are garbled messages. They're not healthy messages. So this gut-brain access, a lot of research being done with respect to how the gut microbiome actually impacts our ability to think clearly. If you're someone who has brain fog and you can't figure out why, it could very well be that imbalance of gut bacteria. But beyond that, if you have depression, anxiety, cognitive dysfunction, any of those things up to and including ADD, ADHD, Alzheimer's disease, autism, all of those things can be linked to an unhealthy gut. What about inflammation, too? In terms oh, of absolutely. Yeah. And because what happens is when these things that are inappropriate leave your digestive system, the poisons, for example, like we mentioned a few minutes ago, that yields toxins. Those toxins then go into the system. The body resp responds and reacts to those. Anytime you have anything like that, the body's going to say, whoa, wait a minute, this doesn't belong here, and will begin to mount, to mount that inflammatory response. And that's why so many people have issues that are associated with chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation is happening because you are chronically delivering a toxic load. Now, what about uh, here, you know, obviously we're, we're approaching the winter months, you know, the role of uh, some of your, your, your natural antibiotics, if you will. I try to, on a daily basis, cover health-related issues, but also prepper-type issues today. We did a little report on, uh, you know, 17 natural antibiotics our grandparents used to use instead of pills. You know, obviously, uh, garlic, turmeric, uh, ginger, olive leaf, echinacea, apple uh, cider vinegar, colloidal silver. Uh, you know, how regular can we use these things? I mean, is there such thing as, as, as overdoing it, even with, uh, you know, ginger or garlic or any of these uh, things we might be putting in our daily as a, meals? As a general rule, no. I mean, you, I suppose you could overdo it with garlic, but you'd get a stomach ache before anything else. So yeah. <laughs> you could, you could, okay? But as a general rule, these things are all natural plant medicines. These are things that our maker gave to us to keep us healthy. These are the reasons why our grandparents and our great-grandparents used these things. They were plant medicines. They were what kept us healthy. Now, in addition to things like that, you know, you said, you mentioned uh, turmeric, you mentioned the ginger, certainly garlic, colloidal silver. Colloidal silver is a wonderful product. Can you take too much colloidal silver? At over a period of time, you could take too much colloidal silver. You just have to make sure that you understand colloidal silver and recognize that you can get too much and don't overdo it. But we also recommend things like products that have beta-glucan. Um, one of the products that I have in the company that I work with, that beta-glucan product is second to none as far as I can find anywhere. We also have great antioxidants, which are so important. Again, trying to keep 
us healthy, trying to keep our systems on top of things. You know, we can clean up our diet. We can do the best we can to clean up our environment. But you mentioned it when we were first getting started. There's so much in our environment that impacts our health that we can't control. So products like a good muscadine grape seed or a good coffee berry product that is loaded with antioxidants, resveratrol, quercetin, those things that help to make sure that we are limiting the toxins as much as possible. Antioxidants, in my opinion, are as important anymore as taking good vitamins and minerals. You know, and I, I was recently reading an article it was somewhere over in Asia somewhere. There was, you know, a gentleman who had reached the age of 140, and here he was on national TV saying, I just want to die. And here we are over here in the West, and it seems like most of us can't get to the age of 60. So what is it, you know, what are they doing over in those Asian communities that are, are different than what we're doing, which is allowing them to seemingly live longer? Again, I don't have any, like, hard proof data, but it just kind of occurred to me the other day that that seems pretty much a common theme. Can we, can we reduce that to the diet? Well, I, per, I personally believe that the answer to that is very much yes. Now, there are some other things, like, for example, when we talk about the Asian population, they're very fond of green tea, and they consume a lot of green tea. Well, guess what? Green, green tea is a very powerful antioxidant. Yeah. helps to keep them healthy. But they're also, and, you know, and, and people will argue with me all the time, well, now, wait a minute, they fry foods all the time. They do fry foods all the time, but they also do other things that keep their systems healthy, like the green tea. What they're frying is not genetically modified. What they're frying has not been sprayed with Roundup. So there's a big difference, and I firmly believe that a big part of the reason why we are so unhealthy is because our food supply is so unhealthy. And people just don't realize it. I had occasion to go out this morning and I'm driving by a billboard and the billboard is talking about trying to keep your children healthy and everything that was on that billboard was, in my opinion, trash food that isn't going to keep your child healthy, that's in fact going to make your child sick. But these are the things that have become commonplace, convenience foods that we give our kids all the time and the end result is we have sick children. And I know you've seen the study that says that this is the first generation whose parents will outlive their children. And it's because they are starting out with too beans, too much toast corn syrup, too many things that just are harming a very young system trying to get established and trying to evolve and become healthy. Now, we're, we're going to close up here. I know, I know we got to finish up here with Dr. Joanne Conway. Again, I'll leave all of her uh, material, her links, directly in the box below and in the blog. <clears throat> what specifically, as we're heading into the winter months here, I mean, should we be changing our diet? Now, you mentioned we, we shouldn't be adding more fats, and I was kind of under the impression in the winter months you, you want to go a little bit heavier on the fats. Maybe I was just wrong. Uh, cor you know, correct me, or even the cholesterol. Um, you know, so what – specific diet should we be looking at for the winter's month and then also uh if you could give us your take on uh a general exercise program there's some who, who've been come on and say you know moderate exercise you know is the best way to go because you don't want to deplete the adrenals uh and i'll allow you to, to to give your take on that okay first of all if i gave you the misconception that we don't want to eat fats i apologize for that it's the bad fats we don't want to eat okay what we want to eat is a good fat. What I recommend for anyone is a ketogenic approach to health. And that is high fat, but good fats. The fats that you're going to get in avocados, the fats in, in nuts. Those are the kinds of fats. And what you need to do is, you know, what I recommend people do is go out and do a little bit of research around ketogenics because ketogenics is becoming very popular. And when you stop and think about it, ketogenics is... High fat, moderate protein, low carbohydrate. Why is that healthy? Well, that's nature's way. If you think about how we have been fed for generations, we have been breastfed, okay? Mom's breast milk's loaded with fat, loaded with protein, minimal carbohydrate. So that's the way our body's supposed to process food. We flipped it around and we got it all out of control when we started with the low fat, no fat craze. So good healthy fats, I think, are very important, and especially during the winter months, 
Good Healthy Fats if you subscribe to a ketogenic program. If you're someone, for example, who is having problems trying to release some of that extra weight, a ketogenic approach can be very beneficial with respect to that. It is very low carbohydrate. That's not bad. Some people say I shouldn't be so low carb. There's no reason you need all those carbs. And then as far as exercise is concerned, the big thing is I agree with not going out and running 10 miles a day every day. That to me is not healthy, never has been, never will be. But moderate exercise is so critically important for various different reasons, not the least of which is to help to keep the lymphatic system moving and flowing like it's supposed to. Your lymphatic system is a major player in your overall health. And if you're someone who has a sedentary lifestyle or if you're someone who sits in front of a computer all the time, you don't impact that lymphatic system the way you should. So I say make sure you get out and take a brisk walk every day. If you live in the upper tier and you can't get out and walk, then perhaps just invest in a treadmill and at least walk a couple of miles a day. You don't have to run. Just walk at a good steady pace and just make sure that your vascular system is kicked up so that you're stimulating lymphatic flow and helping to keep the system healthy. If you don't have a treadmill and can't afford one, find a stair or a step in your house and do stair stepping. Stair stepping is a great cardiovascular stimulating exercise which in turn stimulates the lymphatic system and gets things flowing like you're supposed to. Sedentary lifestyle is not good. It makes your bum spread, but not only that, it limits greatly your body's ability to clean out toxins, flush out toxins, move things through the system the way they're supposed to be moved through. Well, there you have it, folks. Uh, once again, we had Dr. Joanne Conaway with us. Make sure you get uh, her presentation, Why is America Sick? Again, we'll have that in the description box. Are there any upcoming uh, projects, articles you're working on? I think you, you mentioned one earlier. Maybe you could uh, reiterate that one. Uh, any upcoming uh, media appearances or conferences? I, I allow the last few minutes here for some shameless self-promotion, so I'll give you the last few minutes there, and I'll wrap it up. Well, actually, what I'm doing is I'm working on trying to get a consistent blog going. That's one of the things that I'm working on. But if people go out and visit my website, they're going to find the information on the website. They're going to find that... I will be increasing the number of blogs that are out there. They're certainly invited to subscribe to my website and get periodic information from me if that's what they want. They can order my book out there. My book, Why is America So Sick, can be ordered off that website. I also have uh, audios on the digestion portion and hormone portion of the Why is America So Sick lecture. They're also available out there. That's probably the best way for people to find out what's going on in my life. I know that, for example, I'm going out to Indianapolis to speak um, weekend after next, and very excited about that. It is an event that is taking place associated with the company that I'm associated with. And if anyone knows Critical Health News, you know the other people that I am associated with, uh, Dr. Joel Wallach, Ben Fuchs, the people that you know are spokespeople for, for the company and are part of Critical Health News. They're going to be with me at this event in Indianapolis. I'm very much excited about that because I love being with those two guys, rubbing elbows with those two guys, and just, you know, kind of um, brainstorming, if you will, and working on certain things. The other thing that I am currently working on is a new book, another book, and again, that focus is going to be gut brain. So... That's about it. Like I said, most of the information people want about me, they can get on my website. So if anyone has any questions or comments, they're certainly welcome to go out and send me an email. I'm happy to answer those as I get them. Well, I appreciate it, uh, Dr. Conway, for coming on today, taking time out and giving us a lowdown here on uh, you know an area that is often overlooked. And again, I believe it's that important that we should be covering this more and more. So hopefully we can get you back on here in the not so distant future. Maybe we can talk about that gut brain connection. And uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, we got to pay attention to our diet. We have to be disciplined. I know I have to do a better job uh, myself, um, but this is certainly an area, as I mentioned, that is often overlooked. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, stay safe and God bless.